So maybe a first question would be, give us a state of just your tribe. Madison has just been designated in December. Truax Field as the home of F-35A. Doctor, can you start? Give us an overview. They're all new to the Capitol, and they all have new energy and new voices. They're all members of the legi they're all officers of the Legislative Black Caucus. They all have new access to Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes and Democratic Governor Tony Evers. So welcome to a fascinating newsmakers discussion with to my left, Representative David Crowley of Milwaukee, a Democrat who represents the 17th district. He's chair of the Black Caucus, Representative La Keisha Myers, a Democrat from Milwaukee, Vice Chair of the, uh, bl of the Black Caucus, excuse me, represents the 12th District. Representative Sheila Stubbs of Madison, the first minority elected from Dane County, who represents the 77th District. And Representative Kaylin Hayward of Milwaukee, also a Democrat, representing the 16th District. And have you turned 20 yet? Not yet. You have not? <laughs> you're still I was 19. when I announced. I, I, you're still 19. Still 19. Okay, well, that's a wonderful note to open on. Thank you so much. Um, I want to talk about some of the points that uh, Governor Ezer, e Evers excuse me, raised in his speech. But before that, just a quick, I'd like to ask you your top goals for this session, just real quickly before we get to uh, segments of uh, Governor Evers' speech. Mr. Crowley. Absolutely. Well, uh, I think we have a lot of legislative priorities this upcoming session. Uh, but if I had to name, uh, one of the top would be shared revenue, uh, making sure that uh, local municipalities get the resources that they need particularly so they can focus on local issues affecting African Americans Thank in you. their districts. Representative Meyer. Uh, for me it would be education. We're looking at expanding teacher licensure and then looking with some of the things that Governor Evers has talked about with the, uh, giving back two-thirds to school districts, so looking at helping them allocate those funds and getting those special ed dollars back to where they belong. Thank you, ma'am. Representative Stubbs. Criminal justice reform, as you know, in the You're state of Wisconsin. You're a former parole and probation former officer. Former probation and I'm sorry parole for interrupting agent you. right here We will get years. into that, ma'am, I promise. <laughs> but we need <laughs> to look at alternatives to incarceration. We are one of the worst states to incarcerate black and brown people, and I'm here today to say it's a new day in Wisconsin. We're going to change those numbers. Representative. And um, economic development. We'd make sure that we connect families with well-paying jobs, um, affordable and quality housing, as well as transportation to those jobs. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, um, we're going to show on the screen four of the statements made by uh, Governor Evers that deal specifically with uh, residents of Wisconsin of color. So let's go through them one by one and everybody jump in or, well, just whatever you want to say on each of these points. Okay. First point. We are also a state among the worst to raise a black family. What can be done about that? Anybody? I think education is paramount when it comes to raising a black family, with any family really. Um, I know we just looked at the articles that came out this week that talked about how most students that graduate from schools in Wisconsin had to take remedial courses when they entered the UW system. Yes, All of those students didn't come from Milwaukee Public Schools nor in school districts that surround Milwaukee. So it's a statewide issue. So I think we have to look at what are the ways that we're preparing our students to go to college or career? And specifically for African American families, I think education and job creation go hand in hand for, for African American families. Okay, anybody else on Mr. Evers' sure. first point? Absolutely. Well, stuff. right here in Dane County, it's a very vibrant community, but it hasn't always been like that for black and brown people. And I can say here in Dane County, there are 5.5% of African Americans that are unemployed which is just not fair. So we need to create jobs, good family sustaining jobs. In addition to that, we need to continue to create opportunities for everyone. We need to make sure that our kids go to school and get a decent education as well as a de decent meal. Um, I think right here in Madison, there's food deserts. And so that is an area I really want to focus on because how can we expect kids to learn when they don't have a decent meal to eat? So it's a quick follow-up would be when governors past and present talk about our statewide unemployment rate of 3%. That's really a misnomer in terms of the constituents you represent? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a head scratcher that we continue to talk about how uh, Wisconsin is, is booming economically, and we talk about that 3% unemployment rate because we, are double, we have double-digit unemployment rate in African-American communities across this state. So you know, we want to see folks move 
of Ford, not only just talking about the 3%, but let's, let's drill down on what's happening in African-American communities specifically so we can move this state forward together. Okay. Any other comments on Mr. Ebert's first statement? Um, I think pushing the needle on economic development is very, very important for this quote in particular. Um, my district has some of the wealthiest, but also some of the poorest people in the city of Milwaukee, as well as 5206, which is nationally known as being the worst place to raise a black child. So it's very important that we want to get connect parents with jobs. It's really hard to raise a family when you're a single mother or a single father working two, three jobs to make ends meet. You can't be at home. You can't be. Uh, you, can, you can't be as well involved in school. So it's important that we get them with actually good-paying jobs, but also housing. I believe that people respond to their environment. When I walk outside in my neighborhood, I see boarded-up houses, um, trash, landfill. Th there's no grass outside. It makes you respond a different way. But when you walk outside and see beautiful homes, nice grass, clean streets, your attitude and the way you move forward is going to be totally different. So that's very important on how we raise. Um, African-American families. And, and if I could add on that, when Certainly. we think about uh, the eviction rates that happens with, with, with mm -hmm. black single women in general, um, it's become almost the new criminal justice system here in the state of Wisconsin. So we, when, when Rep Representative Kaylin, uh, Kaylin Haywood talks about housing, we need to make sure that we can keep people in their housing, uh, in their houses to make sure that we can do everything for these kids as well. Okay, let's go to a second statement the uh, governor made. It is urgent that we increase support for low-income students and students of color. The longer we wait to invest in closing our achievement gap, the wider the gap will be. Um, you mentioned education is a top priority. Your thoughts on the governor's quote and how to close that achievement gap? Absolutely. I think he was on the money when it comes to that. Um, we've seen the rollbacks in education uh, in the previous administration where funds have just kind of dried up in the public school system. You know, it's kind of a one-size-fits-all model. Um, class sizes have ballooned, especially in uh, large urban areas. In the public school system, it's not uncommon to have 40 students in one classroom. Um, that's ridiculous, <laughs> to say the least. Um, so I think we need to look at trying to attract and retain teachers to come to this state. Um, that's something I'm looking to help with and try to expand those models that we have, that we currently have to get teachers to come here. But you also have to have a supportable wage for a teacher to live and to want to come here when they can go across the state line and teach in Minneapolis or Minnesota and you know they make almost double what they can make here so I think those are things that we have to really look at is our teaching staff adequate and do we have enough no not right now not to sustain the need for the students that we have especially in large urban areas we also have to look at where we allocate the resources a lot of districts are top heavy where they have a lot of administrators telling principals and everybody else what to do but we don't have enough people in the classroom to support those classes where we used to have sage funding um, that would keep k through three you know roughly at 15 students per class so i think we need to revisit that representative studs i'm always intrigued when i look at the achievement gap stats for Madison schools, and they're very close to MPSs. Um, so your thoughts on how to close that achievement gap in the Madison school? You, you're a member of the Board of Supervisors and a long member of this community. Absolutely. First and foremost, cultural competency is critical. Um, I can say as a former special education te teacher, when you enter into the schools, there's hardly any teachers that look like black and brown children. And it's hard for them to understand, understand their environment, understand their language. I mean, I even had an opportunity where we had a session where they're like, let's learn the language of the children because we don't know how to communicate with them anymore. That's really sad. We as teachers don't really know how to have that conversation with our students. But I think right here in Madison, we've done a better job at involving ourselves with, the, with our school district where we've had the, the family engagement component, um, where we're actually having the families meet with staff from the school district and share with them their concerns. And I think that it's time that we understand there is a problem. I think that's been hard to get. People would only hear certain people talk about it's an issue, but now we own up that it's an issue. I think also that we need to do a better job recruiting people that are African Americans. I mean, it's hard for someone to just show up here and want to work here, but what are some of the incentives that we are creating here? I'm very honored to say that we have the One City Learning site that's in South Madison with Kaleem Kair. He's done a wonderful job working with younger kids. And as we're beginning to build those blocks together and partner, partnershiping is critical. Boys and Girls Club, Urban League of Greater Madison, I mean, are just a couple that I can name off the front to, to begin to think about creating internships. And how do we gain kids access back into the workforce when we know they're falling out of the system? And let's be very clear. When these kids are not going to school, 
when they have time, their time is not going to the mall, you know. They're committing crimes. And so we have to begin to learn on how do we create alternatives to our criminal justice system that we don't have these kids being vacuumed in to a system that's so unfair and so unjust. How do we re-involve them into another positive aspect of our community? So those are just a couple of points that we're doing right here in Madison. Okay, anybody thing, else on? Oh, sorry. Uh, no, thing, go ahead, ma'am. One thing I did want to say was that uh, it's not in my particular district, but Kalen's district, he has uh, the 53206 area code. There is something, a collaborative effort with the Urban League of Milwaukee and some other entities with Milwaukee Public Schools where they have something called the Community Schools Model. It is something that is really working in, that, in those neighborhoods. There is now a feeder pattern back in that neighborhood where students will be shepherded from the same elementary schools into one middle school in that area and then going into North Division High School, where there will be resources that are there. It's not just a school where you go from eight to three. It's uh, They have wraparound services. They have uh, the Boys and Girls Club come in for after school programming and tutoring. They also have food pantries that are open to anyone that lives in that neighborhood. So the school is now becoming a real central focus in the neighborhood. So whereas if people are food deficient, they can come in and get food in the, in the school. But the school is where everything operates out of. So I think that's something, a model that other communities, especially in rural communities in Wisconsin and other places, can take a page out of that book and use that model to use the school as a hub for neighborhoods that are in need. Which is a great transition to Mr. Evers' third quote. My urban initiative programs will also empower minority students by expanding early childhood education and summer school grant programs. Excuse me. Thoughts on that goal? Well, you know, I, I have to, I, these, that quote and this past quote that we just talked about, I mean, it, it, was, it was hopeful to actually see the governor, one, mm -hmm. acknowledging us uh, and, uh, and, and telling the rest of Wisconsin that we have been the worst state for African Americans, especially when you talk about the achievement gap. But now the fact that he's actually willing to tackle on early childhood education is even more profound because we appreciate that because we know that education starts early on. And when you talk about the family, it gives us an opportunity to focus on young families as well because we know that many parents are struggling uh, every day here in Wisconsin. So when we can work with uh, parents as well, as well as educating their child and helping them uh, find employment if they're having drug issues, giving them uh, AODA counseling and giving them the resources that they need no matter what it may be, this gives us the opportunity to focus on uplifting black families across the state. Critical programs to the, to the city of Milwaukee and Madison. Sure. Correct? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, finally, let's look at a fourth quote from the governor. It's about seeing the connection between drug and alcohol addiction and our burgeoning criminal justice system. Uh, Representative Stubbs, right up your alley. Up Changes my alley. In, in criminal justice reform, ma'am. Absolutely. We're spending way too many dollars incarcerating people instead of using dollars at the early intervention parts of the system. We know many of the people that are incarcerated, we address residents, employment, support, treatment, and transportation. And if we're addressing these needs prior to incarceration, why is it questionable that these dollars are not following people into our communities? Our communities don't have the dollars available to rehabilitate someone as they return back to our communities. And many of the inmates are not getting all their services right. while they're incarcerated. So you're coming back into a community who's already struggling with dollars and basic needs, and now we're trying to provide a service for someone who's been incarcerated not one year, sometimes 8, 10, 12 years. It's very difficult. We must address AODA issues front and center. The Legislative Fiscal Bureau just came out with its information papers that lawmakers like you read as we debate, as you debate the next budget. And in July of 2018, 43% of adult males in our prison system were African Americans. Mm -hmm. How can we address that? Kaylin, your turn. Um, one thing, so I feel that <laughs> she brought up a good point. Representative Stubbs brought up a good point. People go to prison for sometimes 10 years, 20, that's, two, that's one, two, three decades. And the way the world moves today, I'm 19 years old. But in the last 19 years, things are different than they were 10 years ago. Like, definitely. The world, the phone I have today was like a, a imaginary thing that we would have thought of 10 years ago. So he sent people to prison, prison for decades, and they get out, and then there's no support for them. The world is completely different. They've been out of it for a very, very long time. One thing I want to look at is the reentry process. How are we getting them prepared for the real world again? How can we get them a job before they're out of prison? Now let's mm -hmm. send you out and then you have to find a job within 30 days. How can we have a job lined up for you already? Mm -hmm. So it's about preparing people for the real world because then they, once they're prepared and got the resources, people make mistakes. 
doesn't mean they're bad people. If they want to do good, they want to be a contrib contributor to society and add to society, we got to make sure that we are there as electeds to give them the resources they need. So that's something I'm going to be working on as we move forward. Well, I want to ask you about two things related to this. Uh, the Mr. Charles Franklin of Marquette just released a poll on uh, should marijuana be legalized? 51% of respondents said yes. Does that play a role in the incarceration rate of African Americans? And number two, this uh, instant revocation. So talk to me about those two issues, please. Uh, d definitely crimeless revocations. I mean, we have so many people who are going, uh, who, who are being revocated. I, I believe I'm saying that right. Yes. Uh, going back to jail, basically, because they've broken some, some rules, right? But it's not uniform right rules, now. Rules, and these are victimless crimes. These are victim. Most of the time, they're victimless crimes. And so that is, that is definitely something that we have to look at. But when we talk about, again, 43%, uh, of African American males who've been incarcerated. I mean, at the at the end of the day, we realize that many of these folks have been incarcerated for nonviolent crimes, mm -hmm. and so we have to look at the decriminalization of of marijuana. Right. Um, but we also is a caveat because many people think that just because we may legalize marijuana, that everything will go away. There have been many states that have legalized marijuana, but the incarceration rates of African Americans related to uh, uh, drug crimes specifically, marijuana crimes, have still stayed the same. So we have to make sure that we decriminalize and look at factors moving forward on how we keep this population out of prison. Okay. Anybody else in the criminal justice? Cause well, we need a new concept of our criminal justice system. It's punitive. Yeah. When are we going to move towards transformation and restorative aspects? And you cannot tell someone you're welcoming back home when in fact, as they arrive back home, we're turning around and sending them back. The first 90 days of their life is so critical after being released from prison because that is the quickest time frame in which they will be um, sent back to prison. So we have to walk, work at the reentry aspect, but we need to work on rehabilitation. And I think we've not done a good job in to incarcerate African-American men 8.8 .8 times quicker in Dane County than white counterparts tells me that our system is not fair. It's not equal, and it's not just. Okay. If no other PS is on that subject, let's, let's popcorn some other subject. Guns. How would you change gun laws? And in the wake of the shootings of African Americans by white police officers, 16 times in the case of the Chicago man, a young African American man, should all officers on duty wear body cameras? So I realize I've asked two deep questions here. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for bearing with me. So... Um, so when you talk about, I mean, at the end of the day, for me, it, yes, we all should, all, all police officers should have body cameras. Um, the, 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 the people should have access to those body cameras at the same time when you think about the legislation that was put forward last mm -hmm. session uh, before. But just having body cameras don't do it. That doesn't necessarily keep people safe. And it doesn't necessarily say that, it, you know, when you think about it, we still haven't figured out who's in the wrong, right, when you think about, you know, with the grand juries and how they make these decisions. But we, again, uh, Representative Stubbs kind of talked about this. I mean, it's cultural competency, competency. How are we working with these officers to understand black life? But also building that relationship, uh, specifically in Milwaukee, um, you have officers that patrol particular neighborhoods that they're afraid of, and you have people in those neighborhoods that are afraid of those officers. And so how do we build that relationship of trust so we can move forward and actually come up with a, a solid community policing model that works for everybody? Well, first question, specific changes in gun laws. Anybody want to throw out any? First of all, I think we must treat it as a health epidemic. It mm -hmm. is a crisis, and I don't think that we're treating it as a crisis. Number two, I definitely, begin in, I definitely believe in universal background Absolutely. control yeah. and, and background check. It's really essential, and I must talk about it myself. I mean, I've had an experience of racial profiling. Trust is critical. If we don't trust law enforcement in our communities, how can law enforcement trust us? So it comes back to trust, and I agree with everything that Representative Crowley talked about. It's a trust factor. And uh, communities also, when that happens, we need trauma experts. We fail to give that back to our communities. As students, as children, as families, witness these horrific killings and victims at the same time. What are we doing to help heal those communities? And I think that's the big question mark. And just a personal note, I went to West High School in Madison. You were doing doors in my old neighborhood <laughs> And the police were called? Absolutely. Okay. Knocking on doors while black. Okay, I understand. Um, anybody else on that issue? Because I got a few others. If we I think we talk about, uh, I would just echo Representative Stubbs with the universal background checks. Um, that is definitely something that we have been pushing. I think, uh, I think many people are on board with universal mm -hmm. background checks. 
I mean, it's not the silver bullet to solve everything when you think about all of the violence that we've seen, not just in black communities, but across the, the nation, actually. But it, it, it is a step in the right direction. But you have to also look at some of the red flag laws that right. the attorney general call even mentioned. Absolutely. Right. And so, you know, red flag <laughs> laws can help prevent uh, violence as well. And we right. need to be looking at that in the future. Okay. Also, community mediation. We have a process in Milwaukee where um, people who are in neighborhoods are able to diffuse situations before they may turn violent. And we've seen a decrease in violence in the community because of those programs. So, um, I have a question about Foxconn, and it's this. Foxconn just put out a statement saying, our intent is still to hire 13,000 workers in Wisconsin. Do you think your constituents are in the process of getting trained to hold those jobs? Do you hold out any hope that your constituents would eventually have Foxconn jobs? I realize there's a distance there, but um, thoughts? My question is, is there going to be transportation to help those people get to Foxconn? That's the biggest issue with yep. jobs in southeastern Wisconsin is transportation, mm -hmm. especially for African-American people or people in general. A lot of the jobs that exist, you know, that were formerly in the city of Milwaukee no longer exist there. And people have, if you don't have a car, people have to travel on the bus or some way, get a ride to get there in far suburban areas, and, and that's making it difficult. Um, are there any plans now to train your constituents for potential Foxconn jobs, assuming the transportation issue can be resolved? Are you hearing anything? Um, I, I, I think that there has been some conversations. I mean, you hear what, you know, uh, with what, what Gateway is doing in Kenosha, but, and I th believe that there is some conversations with MATC to, to have some type of partnership. But to, uh, to her point, if, can't, if nobody can get to these jobs, what's the point? Whether we talk in public transportation, and even if they have a car, it's making sure that they can actually have a license. We have many people who've had their license suspended before Revoke. they actually have an opportunity to actually have a license. Yeah. And so if we're not tackling the transportation issue on the public transit side and on the driver's license side, we're not doing much for this community. You read my notes because my next question was, <laughs> the governor said he'd like to have a, a highway, a transportation funding program when he gives you all your, uh, his budget on February 28th. What elements, you just mentioned some, but what elements of that transportation funding plan must be in place for your constituents? You said some of them. Any other thoughts? Are we talking uh, uh, public tra transit? Are we talking regional transit authorities? Uh, regional, I regional always was in favor regional, of a regional, regional transit regional, authority, regional, regional, <laughs> um, which, was, which I pushed Absolutely. for, which I pushed for actually. <laughs> I, I was on the Jobs and Economy Committee and we pushed for a regional transit authority uh, when, when voting on uh, Foxconn. And I think that's one of the si most single ways that we can help out. And it's not just about getting people in Milwaukee to go work at Foxconn, right? Because we know that there are people who work in current manufacturing jobs who may have more experience or who may have the dollars to go back to school, brushing up, and then go to Foxconn. Well, with those jobs open up, who's going to be working there? Will we have transportation there? And so it's not just about the jobs in Racine. We have to look at the job, the, the job market in, in Waukesha and Ozaki and in Washington, where many of these jobs are surrounding Milwaukee County. I think it's, uh, regional transit is a must in the 21st century. If you look at areas that are progressing forward with their job market and economic mobility, if you look at a D.C. or different places like that, we are behind. We have no way for even civil servants who work in Madison that may not want to drive their car every day from, let's say, a Milwaukee or a Racine to get to their job. So it's not even just a manufacturing issue. It's a civil service issue. Well, I could say as a, a county board supervisor, I voted for an RTA system because we need to, I mean, there's people in Illinois, there's people in Minnesota exactly. that want to just have the access to Milwaukee and other parts of our state that don't have it. So I've supported before and I'll support it again. It's a common sense approach. Absolutely. And I think that's what we need to get through. And jobs is necessity. And I have the UW-Madison in my district. Um, and so I can say I have experts. You know, we have a top 10 university. I'm sure they've already received some dollars with the Foxconn involved. I expect that's going to continue to be an ongoing partnership. But again, I represent two parts of the district, a very affluent part of a district, a very centralized student part of the district, and a very poor section of the district. So I represent all of the. I consider myself a blend. I will make sure every component is addressed adequately because that's why I was sent to the 77th. Um, I have a question on health care. Governor Walker said Wisconsin covered with Medicaid everybody below the poverty level. But now the issue 
is expanding Medicaid. How important is expanding Medicaid to your constituents? Extremely critical. Important. It is critical. It is, it is Absolutely. Critical. Good, y'all. Yeah. I, I got responses Absolutely. from y'all. Yeah. Who's going to go first? I, I, I'll go first. Um, is that okay? If that's okay to everybody. <laughs> in my district, I have, I have a lot of homeowners, and most of those homeowners are in their older years of life. Um, also, my grandmother who frequents the hospital very often. So it's very important for them that they have health care and they ha they're able to afford their medications. Because when you hear people share their stories about the family members or themselves, they can end up spending thousand dollars a week on prescription drugs without health care. And I know I can't afford that. In the average Wisconsin, I can't afford it. So we have to do what we can to make sure that our people who need the medication, need their health care, need to need their doctor visits, they have the tools they need in order to. In order to be successful, I did an interview today with uh, Senator Risser, mm -hmm. 91 years old, mm -hmm. and still doing his thing. But it's because he has health care and is able to take care of himself and has what he needs to keep doing his job. So it's important that we make sure that everyone in Wisconsin has that ability and access. So when the governor said in the state of the state, 76,000 more people would get health care, uh, would get Medicaid if we took the federal money, that would affect disproportionately your constituents. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. When you, when, I mean, when, even when the change was made under Governor Walker, we, we noticed really quickly there was a gap in coverage. Right. And it's extremely important that those folks who fell through the cracks are covered this time around because it's, it's either costing them uh, their health or costing them a lot of money out of their pocket. And so when we want to move African Americans particularly forward, especially financially, lo lowering their health care costs is, is, is going to be critical in making that happen. Okay. But also making sure that they have access in general. I mean, we have St. Joseph's Hospital in my district, and we have, which, which is probably they probably see more Medicaid patients than anyone in the in the in the state, and so it's critical that people uh, have access to this. It's really critical. Okay, um, I've been covering our capital since November of 1988, so I watch the choice debate. I'm, I'm going to ask about choice. Choice has been around since the early 1990s in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. Is it a set, settled issue for for uh, you? Milwaukee legislators, or do you still oppose it? It's, I wouldn't say so. It's a it's a trick question it's in a, a sense. No, <laughs> I can say a trick question, but it's a it's a, it's a complicated it's not a trick, question. But it's a difficult. It question. is a difficult question. Thank you, Representative. You're absolutely Trump. right. I'm sorry to say it that way, but it's a difficult question because uh, when you think about you know, for example, it, it's been here pretty much since I've been in school, right? And so I have seen the debate and, and so on and so forth. And I think that you still have people who, are, who support the choice program and people who, who don't support the, cho the choice program. At the end of the day right now, I think the conversation is, how do we move forward in graduating all of these kids right now, no matter how you feel on either side? Um, but even when you, ha when you talk to folks who support it and want to get rid of the choice program, the question remains, how do you do it in a way that the public schools can actually uh, allow this to happen and, and can take on that burden because they've had so many uh, dollars uh, removed from them? But even if you support it, um, the question is, is how do you su support, bo sustain both of these systems? And so I think it's, it is a difficult question to answer, but I think it's, it's constant ongoing uh, discussions that's going not only in, in Milwaukee about it, but I think uh, throughout the state still. Um, we have groups like Milwaukee Succeeds that's working with both uh, Choice um, Private Schools and NPS looking to move the needle forward for all black children. And at this point, um, we can have that discussion. I, I, think that, I think it's fine to have that discussion. But when we talk about African-American children, right now I don't think the, the, it matters on whether or not what school that they go to if we're not graduating them at the rate that we need to and they're proficient in all, the, all, all of the math, reading, science, et cetera. Okay. Well, Joyce, is a difficult question, so maybe I better move on. I don't want to put you <laughs> well, on I the spot. I just want to say that I don't yes, think we can sustain where we are now as far as having one set amount of money and having all these different competing entities. Now, that's where I'll leave that. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Governor Evers and Lieutenant Governor Barnes have appointed more African Americans and women as cabinet secretaries and senior advisors than any governor I've certainly seen. Are you satisfied with his diversity efforts? I think at the I think at the administrative uh, with this administration he has done um, quite well, um, but I think that when as as a black person in Wisconsin we always talk about making sure that state government is representative of everybody within the state, and so if, I don't think that we need to look at his administration and say okay you've done enough, and I believe that he believes that he has we have a long way to go when it comes down to having diversity. 
uh, throughout state government because it's not just about the governor's office and the departments that he's over, but it's all about the legislative staff. How many African Americans do we employ in the assembly and the Senate and, and, and in many of the nonpartisan agencies that we rely on? And so I think it's key that uh, while we, we definitely uh, give him props uh, for what he has done, but I believe that we are all in the same uh, in the same corner when it comes down to there is more that needs to be done. Okay. Any PSs on that? I think this diversity and inclusion thing is much bigger than just the administration. Like, like Representative Crowley said, it's the legislature, but it speaks to like every employment, corp the corporate world, everywhere. We have to make sure that everyone's been included. Um, I know, so in development, when we do, when people do developers, they're all complaining about mandates about how you have to hire certain people from certain zip codes or certain the city or from uh, certain ethnic groups. And they say it's hard. It's not. So the thing is to make sure that on all levels, whether it's government, the private sector, whatever it is, people are being hired and included. We want people to see themselves. Um, my thing is when I go knock on doors, I'm talking to younger kids, I'm talking to little boys and girls. I want them to be able to see themselves in me and believe that they can do it. So it's important that we have people in all types of job sectors that these young children, rather black, white, rich, poor, they see themselves able to do that. And I think when you think about diversity, how much is enough? And I think that we like to cap uh, diversity. Right. Let's not do that. Let's not put ourselves in a position where we need to be at 10 milliliters, 20. No, let's diversify the state. The state of Wisconsin should look like the people that reside here, that voted for us, that sent us here. I don't think we've done enough. No. We, all of us collectively, could do more. And that's why I want to make sure that I allocate dollars. I want to make sure I put provisions there. I want to remove provisions that have not allowed enough diversity to go through certain jobs. We are putting limitations. We are doing job qualifications. And that limits the amount of people that we have selections for. I can say as a first-time legislator, I hired an African-American young man from right here in Madison who just graduated, Savion Castro. I'm honored to have hired him. He is qualified, but he's going to make a difference. And he's a young, a young man who's going to go in our capital and make a difference with me. That's the kind of steps we need to take. Um, a follow up on Lieutenant Governor Barnes. When he gave a speech on Dr. King's, uh, uh, the celebration of Dr. King, he said, I realize the historical figure I am. Here's my question. If there's not major progress on some of these issues that are so vitally important to you, are you afraid in two or four years, uh, Lieutenant Governor Barnes is going to be blamed or scapegoated for that lack of progress? You worried about any potential downside for the first African-American lieutenant know, governor? I mean, I think that at the end of the day, I think that we are all in a position to kind of make sure that we protect him as well because a lot of this is going to be on his shoulders. And I don't think that we can blame him. Uh, we have many, uh, when you talk about the, the Democrats in general, I mean, many of us talk about diversity and inclusion. Right. We just really need to put our money where our mouth is and actually do it. And so it is, it is not just up to the Black Caucus or right. Lieutenant right. Governor Barnes to do this. We all have some skin in the game when it comes down to creating diversity and inclusion, not only just through our state government, but to Representative Haywood's point, even within the private sector. Even when we talk about who contracts with the state, who's contracting with state government, um, making sure that there are not only women-owned businesses, but also minority-owned businesses, black-owned businesses that are getting many of these contracts. And I think that's a, another thing that we all, we all have to look at. And uh, I, I, again, we all have skin in this game. We can't blame just n one person. Um, because at the end of the day, uh, we're all elected to, to come here and make some change. Okay, now you three are just beginning your first terms. You're starting your second term. Yes. So here's my question. As you interact with the Republicans who control the legislature, do you sense that they're interesting in dialoguing on some of these unique urban issues that you're going to bring over the next two years? What's your initial sense? Have you begun to, to explain things maybe a little different? I have. I've had yeah. one meeting. Okay. And I, I had a wonderful meeting with our chair, Chair Shra, from Corrections. I'm on the Corrections Committee. Wonderful conversation. Okay. I know what That's I believe in, Thank and you. I know what I've sent here to do, and I know what I want to do. And uh, let's just say this. We know the Department of Corrections have more dollars spent there than we do at any of our UW systems, which is just daunting, which is unacceptable. And so I want to keep that message there. And to the point with Mandela, before Mandela became our lieutenant governor, we had problems with our systems. We know our numbers were staggering, so we cannot allow Mandela to take in all of this, our lieutenant governor, as a failure. We will not allow him to fail. That is not why he was saying the people of the state sent him here, because they believe in him. 
They believe in his message. And I believe I have a part uh, to do. And so I will do my part. And hopefully we can make a big impact in reducing our daunting disparities that exist right here in the state. I think uh, also looking at it, when looking at individuals across the aisle and having meetings with them, I think that's a good first step. I've, you know, I, I've been engaged by, by other Republicans that are they've come to realize after we have our conversations that urban and rural are one in the same, okay. realistically. Thank you. On many issues, it's, it's, it's one thing. You know, it just looks a different way because you may live five houses down from the next neighbor <laughs> versus me being right next door and being five feet from the neighbor, but we still have the same issues. So I think once we get past that and the fear that comes along with I, I don't know because that's not my experience. Mm -hmm. I think when you have those dialogues and conversations, you can work together and get some things done. Two final questions. There's going to be a presidential presidential election next year. Uh, who would you like? Who? Which Democrat would you like to see elected? <laughs> it's very one. early. The, the best, best one. one. The the best best one. one. <laughs> How about a specific name, Kaylin? Anybody? The best one. Whoever he or she may be. The Democrat. There is. Yeah. Right. I, I know Democrat. there's been a few folks who have always who've already put their name out there. Well, uh, people, I mean, Senator uh, uh, Harris, put, Harris, Kamala yeah. Harris. She's probably called you as chair of the Black Caucus, or uh, what? Yeah. <laughs> not, not yet. Yeah, but not yet. But the phone's about to ring. <laughs> But I think I think that you know when, when it comes down to it, uh, being in my in, being in my second term, I've learned to wait until to see how many people is all okay. out there in the race <laughs> before you make early. a decision. Yeah, okay. um, but you know, I think that we're going to see a lot of interesting people getting into this next presidential election. I'm just excited to see who's all going to get in. Is there any name anybody wants to offer as somebody who should run? David Crowley. <laughs> 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 You're good. <laughs> okay. I want to end it this way. I want us to read a quote from President Barack Obama, and I want to ask you whether you agree with it. You ready? President Barack Obama, when he was president, said, things are getting better. Each successive generation seems to be making progress and changing attitudes when it comes to race. Along this long, difficult journey, we're becoming a more perfect union, not a perfect union, but a more perfect union. Let's end it this way. You agree with that, Representative Crowley? Uh, to an extent. I mean, I think that we are getting better for the simple fact that we are now uh, having more open dialogue about race relations here uh, throughout the country. But when you talk about, uh, are, is it getting better for African Americans in general? I would say no, we still have a long way to go. Um, just like Representative Stubbs said, we can't put a cap on it. We have to see a lot of incremental change happen. And uh, many of these changes we've been fighting for for almost 40 years since Dr. King. And so, um, no, I don't necessarily, I, I guess I can say yes and no. Okay. Yes Rep and no. Representative Myers? I, I think when his conversation about race, that is true, uh, in teaching young children, you know, they all can interact with each other. You have to be taught how to hate, basically. And, you, and, and that's a learned behavior. You don't just start that way. So I think once children understand for themselves and as they grow up, they're more tolerant, more so than probably my parents' generation and the generation before them, uh, because of their interactions. They, all they know is desegregated schools. All they know is, you know, open housing. All they know is, you know, open public spaces where, you know, there's no colored and white water fountains. So this is the world that they live in. I do think that now in this age of where we are and who we have as our president, you know, you can see racism rear its ugly head again to know that we're not there yet, right. but we have made significant progress. Thank you. Representative Stubbs? It has gotten better um, when I think about the civil rights decade from a colored fountain to a white fountain. Yes, it's gotten better. Is it a long way to go? Absolutely. Have we overcome? No. No, we have not. And I think that we can't think that we have because when I think black and brown people or people of color think that we've arrived. And I think during the time when we had our first African-American president, some people felt like he was there forever. He was there just eight years. And it seems like a long time ago, just over two years ago, and it's like he's, he's gone. But he did so much when he was there. And so I know that when you look at the staggering numbers for African-American incarcerated, over 40 indicators from poverty to our kids in the juvenile justice systems to our education disparities, it is alarming. It is unacceptable. But what I can say is that we are beginning to have conversations about race and relationships. That's a long way in this country. 
But at the same time, we're having relationships about love and hate at the same time based on who's in leadership. We have a long way to go. Thank you. Representative Haywood. Uh, I agree with the statement. When you, I think about six years ago, I'm 19 years old. In 2019, I'm an elected official for the state. Six years ago, that would have never been possible. So I feel that, yes, we made great strides. Now, when you look at that in the total magnitude of the journey we have to go, we haven't done much. But the, the change that we have seen ha has been some good change. The fact that we're all here today talking about this <laughs> says a lot. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we, do, we have to, we, we have to think about where we came, came from and what we have done, but also remember how far we just have to go. So I find that's important, but also it's important to focus on tomorrow. It's the bigger picture. Too often we don't look at the bigger picture of things. We focus on the now. So with the bigger picture of things, we haven't came very far. But when you look at what we have done, it's been monumental. Fascinating discussion. I want to thank you all very much. I have an idea. At the end of this session, would you all come back and we can talk about the progress that's made? Let's put it in the positive. Absolutely. Okay? Absolutely. If you bring water, I'm here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Thank you. I want to thank Representative David Crowley, who represents the 17th District from Milwaukee. Representative Keisha Myers, who represents, the, represents excuse me, the 12th District from Milwaukee. Representative Sheila Stubbs of Madison, who represents the 77th District. And Representative Kaylin Haywood of Milwaukee, who represents the 16th. When are you going to turn 20, young man? Uh, June. In June. Gemini's. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.